How many of you sitting here this morning have one publisher's clearinghouse for each state? Anybody, anybody ever one publisher's clearing house sweepstakes? No. How many of you have ever been told that you have won the publisher's clearing house sweepstakes? Everybody can get those flyers back. I think it was like early, late 80s, early 90s where they were actually telling people, hey, you won. Uh, <laughs> so it was a few years ago that uh, I got a flyer, probably about two or three years ago, I got a flyer in the mail, and it was from a local car dealership. It wasn't Troy. <laughs> was, was it, I, I'm sure it wasn't Troy's. It was not Troy's, but uh, it, was, it, was, it, it actually said, you've won a brand new truck. We went around and I was like, cool, I've won a new truck. And if I, and it also said, it came with like a, a coin that was attached. This coin was is specifically designed for you. You come and bring that coin to claim your brand new truck. You, you've won. And I'm like, ah, okay, cool. I've won a truck. And then I happened to flip it over and I noticed it said financing available. <laughs> okay, so if I want a new truck and financing is available, that means... <laughs> That's not free. <laughs> That's not free. Right? And what's funny, oh, you know what I won? If you read the, if you read the fine print, I actually, call, I actually called. And uh, you know what I won? I, I had won a test drive. <laughs> well, who hasn't won a test drive? Yeah. Right. Uh, and I made a mental note. I, I was never going to go again. It wasn't, obviously, it was not choice. <laughs> I made a mental note. I'm not going to ever purchase a car there, I don't think. <laughs> Too good to be true. We've all been there. We've all had those experiences where somebody promises something and it's too good to be true. And We've all been there. It, it, th those are examples of the more egregious things, the more blatant promises and claims that are made along the way. But the reality is we've all experienced promises that haven't been kept or promises in a job, promises in a relationship, promises in an event in life where something was said to us, some claim was made, some benefit was offered and promised and it turns out it, it, it sounded too good to be true, and in fact it was too good to be true. That's going on a little bit this morning in our gospel lesson. Things that are too good to be true. We've all been in situations in which those promises and claims that were too good to be true then in the wake of all those things left us with disappointment and disillusionment, sometimes disenfranchisement. And those disappointments can become heavy and start to wet. And that is going on in John chapter 20. John chapter 20 opens with the news that Jesus is risen from the dead. And for those that were closest to Jesus, that was too good to be true. In fact, John 20 basically chronicles for us what's going on with the various people that were very close to Jesus and then dealing with this news that he's risen. And their response is, it doesn't confuse. It's too good to be true because Jesus, three days earlier, had been arrested, put on trial, and then killed, executed, crucified, like a common criminal. And those who are having a hard time believing it, too good to be true, then experience throughout this chapter in John 20, Jesus actually showing up. <laughs> and he appears to Mary, he appears to those who are his closest followers. And all of a sudden, what is too good to be true? No, it is in fact, that is good news. 
It has actually happened. Jesus is risen for the dead. Except a guy named Thomas. And Thomas has missed out on all the fun. We get to our passage that we read, uh, that, that Joe read for us. Thomas has missed out on all the fun. He, he's still struggling with this idea. And for him, it is too good to be true. And he actually verbalizes it. I don't believe it. It's too good to be true. I saw him get arrested. I saw him put on trial. I saw him crucified. And unless I put my hand in his scars and in his eyes, I'm not going to believe it. it. It's too good to be true. Well, the interesting thing, man, is Jesus shows up again. And this time, Thomas is there. <laughs> and Jesus tells Thomas, it's interesting, put your finger here. Jesus is repeating the very words that Thomas had said. Put your fingers there. Look at my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. You know, Thomas has been certain that there's no way Jesus is alive, and now he's confronted with the physical reality that is, in fact, what he thought was too good to be true. Is that actually true? And so for Thomas, it is good news. You see, Thomas, without seeing Jesus, is still struggling with the too good to be true idea because nobody does this. All these claims throughout the book of John, in fact, throughout the Gospels, all these claims about what Jesus could do for them and do for those to whom John is writing, always too good to be true because nobody does this. Nobody does this. Nobody goes and willingly suffers and dies for somebody's sin. Nobody does that. No one sub subjects themselves. The hands of the enemy, willingly. No one is going to promise eternal life to me. No one does it. It's too good to be true. But in fact, Thomas finds out. And he then acknowledges, yeah, it is true. And he responds with a confession of faith, my Lord, my God. Acknowledging he believes that Jesus is God himself and he has risen from the dead. You know, Thomas is brought to the end of himself. And he responds in faith. And as John is telling this story in John chapter 20, of Jesus showing up to Mary and then Jesus showing up to those who are closest to him and then showing up uh, to Thomas. The reason he's giving these stories about what happens after Jesus rises from the dead isn't simply to let us in on, oh, hey, Jesus rose from the dead. That, that is going on here. But what John is doing is John is actually writing these stories to a church in his own time. In a series of churches in his own time, they're dealing with the same things. They have the same doubts. They have the same worries. They have the same fears. He's seeing Thomas in those he worships with on Sundays. He's hearing the doubts. He's hearing fears. It's too good to be true, especially in John's day when Caesar and Rome are increasingly threatening. The life of the church. And they begin to wonder, huh? Oh, okay. Now, is this what I signed up for? Is this what I signed up for? Is Jesus really who he said he was? Is Jesus really who you claim he is? Is Jesus really this Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? And so John ends this story of Thomas. And ends all these stories in John chapter 20 with a summary statement. And in his summary statement, he's not only wrapping up these stories, he's wrapping up the entire letter that he has written to his church. John tells us this, that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. 
And John is saying, you know, there's a whole lot more I could have written. There's a whole lot more that Jesus did with his followers. But I haven't written them down. What I have written down here is for your benefit. So that you would believe. These are written so that you would come to the very same conclusion as Thomas has. So if you haven't seen him, you haven't seen Jesus like Thomas has. But I've written these things down so that you will come to the same idea, the same thought, the same belief. You see, John's audience has heard these stories. They've seen these things. It's why they are already meeting as a church. They've come together just like we are here this morning. And all this stuff about Jesus dying and rising for them increasingly too good to be true. I can't believe it. John is saying as he writes, yeah, it seems that way, just like it seemed like that, just like it seemed to Thomas. But it really is true. These are written. From the very first chapter of John's book, if we were to go to John 1, we see John presenting Jesus, a story about Jesus and John the Baptist, Jesus being presented as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we follow this Lamb through the book of John, and we see Jesus turning water into wine. We see Jesus meeting with a woman at the well, sworn enemies of Israel, and he's eating and drinking with them. Jesus feeds thousands of people using just five loaves and two fish. He's walking on water. He's healing blind men. Then he raises one of his best friends from the dead. These are written so that you would have faith, so that you would come to understand Jesus for who he is the same way that Thomas has. And just what is it then that they find so incredulous? What is it that they're having trouble dealing with? They're dealing with the same problem that many of the Israelites in Jesus' day had. Many of the Jews had the same problem. And it shows up in John's Gospel. And that is, the thing that was most incredulous to them was, this is not the Messiah that we expected. Jesus says, these are written that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They were having trouble buying that idea. This idea of a Messiah, this word comes... And it's applied to a figure in the Old Testament. And throughout the Old Testament, if we, were to, if we were to read from Genesis all the way through Malachi, there is this figure in the Old Testament increasingly known as Israel's Savior. And attached to this Messiah guy is all sorts of promises for Israel. All sorts of great things are going to happen when the Messiah finally shows up. He's going to save Israel. But the problem was, Israel in Christ's day had, had been thinking, and this is a military leader. This is a political figure. This is somebody who's going to save us from Caesar and Rome. And that increasingly was a problem. Because Caesar was about, <laughs> his little experiment of allowing Israel to do its own thing was coming to an end, even when Jesus shows up on the scene. They're having a tough time computing with a, with a Messiah guy who's going to get himself killed at the hand of the Romans. Which is exactly what happens to Jesus. You know, they were looking for somebody to come and sit on David's throne. Because those are the promises that had been attached to this Messiah figure in the Old Testament. It was a struggle for them. It seemed to be a struggle for Thomas. Israel's Messiah was expected to be somebody who was going to be a great military and political figure. And John goes to great lengths throughout his book that that's not the Messiah that was promised. That's not the kind of Messiah that was coming. That in fact, Israel's Messiah would come in weakness and humility. You know, all of these things, all of the stories, all of these miracles that he's chronicling for them. Even eating with sinners. That's the kind of Messiah that has been promised. That's the kind of Messiah that they need. 
and that Thomas needs. This is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Now, not only had they gotten the Messiah wrong, they also got wrong what exactly the Messiah was going to entail. Not just he was going to be a, mili a military leader, but no, in fact, he's going to come in humility and come in suffering and come healing people and eating with sinners. Not only is he going to do that, they also miss the fact that along the way in the Old Testament, God is showing Israel that this Savior who is coming somewhere down the line was going to be God himself. It's not simply going to be some God. It's not going to be simply some Savior. You see, going back to the Garden of Eden, if we go all the way back to Genesis, the big problem in the Old Testament, the big problem is sin. The broken relationship. Adam and Eve sin. And before they're out of the garden, before God kicks them out, he promises, hey, you know what? This is bad. You've disobeyed. I'm pushing you out. But someday, I'm going to fix this. And I'm going to fix this myself. He gives a promise that there is going at some point to be a seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. And so the storyline of the Old Testament follows all that. See, one of the things that Israel missed was that the Messiah was going to be God himself. So John has gone to great pains in his text to show that this one who comes eating and drinking with sinners, who comes in humility, who comes healing, is also the Son of God. These are written that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Because you know what? This sin problem, only God could come as a lamb to take away the sin of the world. You can't be so of God. It's got to be God himself. Only God can die for sin, and only God can offer life. Only God can offer life, and ultimately then, that is what John is after with the people to whom he's writing. That's what Thomas needs. Again, if we go back to the first chapter of John, it'd be interesting, again, the interesting study, you can do the remedy of this this morning, we'd be here all day, but interesting study. Walk through John sometime and start circling all the times that life is mentioned. It's a big deal. You want to know why? Because life is what we need. Life is what his church needs. In fact, so much so, as we get to John 20, we should be convinced that life is what we most need. It is our biggest need. These are written. That you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, have life in his name. It's all about life. John's been writing this whole time, helping us to see, helping his church to see that their greatest need, Rome may be breathing down their necks, ready to snuff the life of the church out. And you know what? Their greatest need right then isn't salvation from Rome. Their greatest need is life in Jesus. And it's the same, same thing with us. Every single day, all of the time, our biggest need is life. Because our worst problem is sin. Our worst problem is being disconnected from Jesus, being disconnected from God. And that's why Jesus came. He came to fix that. He came to rectify that. He came to reconcile this relationship between man and God that had been fractured. It's very, very easy for us to forget in the commotion of our lives and all the busyness of everything that we are doing that our biggest problem is sin. That our biggest problem is this fracture of a relationship between ourselves and God. And then it becomes very easy for us to miss that our biggest need is life in Jesus. Eternal life. The life that is right with God. Sin is our, sin is our biggest problem. Death is our biggest enemy. And life is our greatest need. 
and Jesus comes here to give it to us. Life without Jesus is not life at all. Jesus shows up to offer life. God comes in a human body. He's saying, I've come that my sheep would have life and have life in abundance. So John has written all of these stories and all of these conversations throughout his book. So that his audience, like Thomas, would believe that Jesus is everything that he was promised to be. Who by believing find the life that they need, the life that we need. And this life is only found in Jesus. The one who identifies with the weak, the one who eats and drinks with sinners, the one who comes to be and identify with those who are the losers and the disenfranchised, he comes offering life, bringing life to those who don't deserve it. And that's good news. <laughs> in fact, when we hear that, when we hear that for the first time, in fact, when we hear that any time, my, my reaction is, that's too good to be true. It can't be true. Nobody would do that for me. And yet Jesus does. He does. Why are we talking about this this morning? Because, again, as we have these services, as we come together and we celebrate table, even as we are moving towards September 15th and launch up doing these things all the time, we're always going to be reminded that as we have a new community here in Los Fresnos, we will always need to be highlighting those things that are written. Why? Because our greatest need is life. Our greatest problem is sin. Our greatest need is life. These are written that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Why do we even have life? So we're going to have a new community. We're going to have to be emphasizing this. And that is something else going on here, something that's very, very easy to miss. Why is it that we've committed to honoring Jesus and honoring the word here at the table? Again, that answer is found here in John 20, 31. You see, these are written. It doesn't simply refer to John's gospel. It refers to everything between the covers. From Genesis to Revelation. This whole thing. There are clues. In fact, there are clues throughout John's gospel that that's what he's building toward. This whole thing was written. The whole Bible was given to us so that we would believe that Jesus is the, the Messiah and by believing have life in his name. So all of, all of the stories here, from Genesis, the first book, to Revelation, the last book, from Adam and Eve to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to Joshua, to David, to Solomon, to Daniel. All of, all of these stories are written so that we would believe that Jesus is the promised one, that he is the Messiah, and by believing, have life in his name. If our need is life, if our need is forgiveness, if our need is grace, then we will always be making the Bible a priority for the table. In our teaching, our preaching, our walk with Jesus. Because it's here. It's here in this Bible. It's here in God's Word. That we are told the story of Jesus and we're told our story. You see, this isn't simply the story of Jesus. This is our story. This is about us. And what we need in Jesus. The entire Bible was written so that we would believe and have life 
in Jesus. So as we read John 20, as we hear these stories about what's going on after Jesus' resurrection, as we read this story of Thomas, who wants to see Jesus and stick his hand in his side and make sure he's who he really says he is, we should see ourselves there. We should hear a lot of ourselves in Thomas. And what our greatest need in the moment, in any given moment, any given day, any given time, is life in Jesus. That's what we need. Because too often we think it's too good to be true. No one spends time with sinners like me. No one deserves, no one deserves this. No one gives something who fails over and over and over again a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth. No one, no one does that except Jesus. So when I'm a doubter, when I'm in unbelief, and I'm in that moment, I have to come here again. I have to hear the words of Jesus. I have to come to him again for life. We will always be talking about Jesus from the Bible, from the table, because we always come with our fears, we always come with our doubts. We come into this room and we say that, this, all this grace, it's too big to be true. Nobody does this. And yet, in that moment, it's Jesus that meets us here with forgiveness and with grace. He gives us salvation. He gives us the life that we need more than anything else. You know, we hear those. We hear the promises. In the scriptures, we hear the promises of who Jesus is and what he is for us. And we have a tendency to think, oh, that is too good to be true. And Jesus meets us here and he says, it is true. It is true. 